Hi, I am Dr. Felice Gersh. I'm your integrative OBGYN doctor here to do part two, all about the vaginal microbiome. First, just to introduce myself, I have a private practice dealing predominantly with women's health issues. I'm board certified in OBGYN and in the new field of integrative medicine. My practice is in Irvine, California. And I do this Instagram live show, which is also on my YouTube channel, because I want to reach as many women as I can, even those who can't maybe come and see me in person or on telemedicine, because I want to educate, inform, and empower you to take charge of your own health. Today, we're going to talk part two about the vaginal microbiome. As a very quick recap, the vaginal microbiome is a very complex ecosystem. The vagina has predominantly lactobacillus. These are a type of bacteria that are aerobic, meaning they love to be in an oxygen-rich environment, and they produce lactic acid and hydrogen peroxide. And by doing so, they acidify the vaginal environment. Now, the upper portion of the vagina is not aerobic, it is anaerobic, meaning that it has bacteria there that hate and cannot live in an oxygen-rich environment. Now, when there is an imbalance of the microbiome, what often happens is that the anaerobic bacteria become predominant, and these include such types as Gardnerella, Apodobium, and um, Mirabilis. So these different types are, oh, and the Megasphera. So the anaerobic bacteria become the dominant type. And because of the way that they ferment, they create products that often have a very fishy odor. And that is a very common sign of a bacterial vaginosis, an overgrowth of anaerobic bacteria creating this really very uh, unpleasant, fishy, dead fishy type of odor. Other symptoms that are associated with vaginosis are irritation, burning, discharge, and sometimes even itching. That's why it's very tricky for women to self-diagnose. There are a few tricks I'm going to tell you. Many women, as soon as they have a vaginal discharge or some irritation, they immediately think that it's a vaginal yeast infection, which of course I'll also touch on. And there, there certainly can be an overgrowth of vaginal yeast, or we call candida albicans, or one of the other forms of candida. The albicans is the most common, but there are now others that have taken hold from the candida or yeast family. So over-the-counter products exist for vaginal yeast infections, and they include the different types of products like Monistat. Now there are also prescription anti-yeast creams as well, and an oral pill, Diflucan, that is also prescribed, but that's done by, like I said, by prescription. So one of the ways that you can try to find out what kind of a vaginal infection that you have is by testing with a pH strip. So if the pH is quite high, meaning it's alkaline, that is more suggestive of a bacterial infection. If you do have a bacterial infection, or if you try to self-treat for yeast and it doesn't get better, please be sure you go in and see your physician, your healthcare professional, usually an OBGYN, but it could be a family doctor, to get tested. Now, the testing of the vaginal microbiome has really come a long way. It's no longer just a simple culture. You can actually do PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which actually looks at the DNA. This is extremely helpful because remember, the bacteria that may be living inside the vagina may not survive when you put it on a swab and take it outside into the oxygen. So they will die and then you won't have growth on a culture. By looking for the DNA evidence with a PCR test, you get a much clearer picture of what is going on and you can actually get even different types of lactobacillus that are growing 
And so you have a much clearer idea of the vaginal microbiome within yourself, or you know, if you're the physician like me, for your patient population. Now, what can we do? I had mentioned before, we want to prevent infections in the first place, if at all possible. So if you do use tampons or you use the um, one of the other products, you know, if you use a, a, a menstrual cup, consider not using it at night, letting the vagina kind of rest. And if you do use the tampons, please use organic and change them fairly fr frequently. The longer the tampon stays in, the more chance that you'll get actually an infection. Menstrual blood is actually alkaline. Remember, the vagina is naturally healthy with a low pH when you have a lot of growth of the healthy lactobacillus. So the natural healthy vaginal microbiome is typically from 3.8 to 4.5. That's a very acidic environment. Now, blood is not acidic. And so when you have blood sitting for a long time within a tampon in the vaginal canal, that will promote the growth of the bacteria that we don't really want. Things, for example, like strep. So we do not want to have the long-term input sitting in there of these tampons. Now, as well, when you use the tampons, as I mentioned, it changes the oxygen ratio in the vagina because of it being in there. So it can alter the microbiome in that method as well. Make sure you don't use any sort of antimicrobial soap or any harsh cleaner on the outside genital skin. Because remember, that also has its own microbiome and helps to protect the inside of the vagina. Make sure also that you eat foods that have natural probiotics in them. My personal favorite is sauerkraut, but a lot of people like kimchi and um, kombucha or any other fermented vegetable. Now, there are dairy products like yogurt that are also fermented, but many of them are they are pasteurized and there really aren't any healthy colonies inside or they've actually been pasteurized and then they add in some sort of a culture which really isn't necessarily particularly favorable for the human. So I prefer myself utilizing fermented vegetables as my source of a probiotic food because the healthy gut microbiome is very important as well for having a healthy vaginal microbiome. So what else can we do to have a healthy vagina? Well, what about when you have sexual activity? One thing that is very helpful is to use, if someone, if a couple is having oral sex, is to use what's called a dental dam. Now, you can also use a condom. So it would be a piece of latex that would be something of like a large square, pretty big about like that, and it's put over the female genital area, and that helps to prevent contact with saliva. It turns out saliva has a lot of bacteria in it and can be quite irritating to the skin of the female and it's not really good for the vaginal microbiome. So just be aware, saliva is not a friendly material for the female genital tract. Also, condoms help to prevent contact with semen. So if you're not trying to get pregnant, it's really helpful, especially if you're prone to getting vaginal infections, to have a male partner use a condom, or as a female, you can use a female condom. What this does is it prevents contact um, of the vaginal canal with semen. Semen is very alkaline. Once again, it will change the vaginal microbiome because it's an alkaline environment. Now, this is particularly important for women who are prone to vaginal infections. Now, remember, you can also have a sexually transmitted infection like gonorrhea or chlamydia. And these are more likely to happen in women who have an altered vaginal microbiome. So we want to make sure that we have the right pH and the right microbiome as a, a protectant against acquiring sexually transmitted infections. So what can, other than having, for example, oral sex 
or having semen contact the vagina, what other types of things can alter the health of the vagina and, and alter the vaginal microbiome and alter the pH? Well, one is loss of estrogen or altered estrogen status. So for example, birth control that changes the hormonal environment of the female genital tract. That includes things like oral contraceptives and the progestin IUDs like Mirena IUD and there's other Skyla and so on. So they will actually change some of the environment in the vagina by altering the hormonal milieu. So that can change how the vagina is um, in terms of its pH and therefore affect the microbiome. Estrogen also is lost after menopause. And this also then has a big impact on the vaginal microbiome. It turns out that estrogen, the, the type made by the ovaries, is really critical to maintaining a healthy vaginal pH and microbiome. And how does that work? Because estrogen allows glycogen to be produced by the mucosal lining cells of the vagina. And this acts as a food source for the lactobacillus that produce lactic acid and hydrogen peroxide that maintain the acidity of the vagina. Without estrogen, and this has been shown in menopausal women, you get a more alkaline environment and you lose a lot of your lactobacillus because the environment becomes hostile to them and because without the adequate estrogen, you don't have the glycogen that acts as the fuel for the, as the food fuel for the lactobacilli. So you can see it's a, a, a feed forward kind of mechanism, whereas you lose your lactobacilli, the pH goes in the wrong direction and you get a more alkaline environment, which makes the environment even more hostile for the lactobacillus. And then you get the overgrowth of the abnormal or the pathogenic bacteria in the vagina. So this becomes quite a problem. And birth control pills, because they don't have the normal hormonal um, balance that would be had in a woman who's cycling and has her own normal ovarian production of hormones, women on oral contraceptives and similars will have altered production of the glycogen, they'll have altered microbiomes, and it will become more alkaline, less acidic, less favorable for the lactobacillus. So these are really important things to know. So condoms, dental dams, thinking about the type of contraceptive that is used can all be very important. There's a new type of contraceptive out that is designed to create a very acidic environment in the vagina because sperm, as I mentioned, live in semen and semen is alkaline. So sperm are killed in an acidic environment. And by using this acidic gel that's available, it's called a vaginal microbiome modulator. So it's a new form of contraceptive. It's a gel that's like a lactic acid based gel that makes the vagina quite acidic and it's a very thick, heavy type of a gel that's inserted in the vagina. And it's about 90% effective, but can be used with any other form of contraceptive. And there's some research ongoing that this new type of contraceptive gel may also help lower the risk of transmission of sexually transmitted diseases like chlamydia and gonorrhea. So that is actually very good news. About somewhere between 10 and almost 20% of women had some degree of irritation or burning from this gel, but most said it wasn't severe. So it's something to consider to try. Now, in my own practice, when I am treating, one of the things that I learned just actually not that long ago is that you can't just kill. So the conventional treatment for vaginal infections, whether it's a fungal infection or a bacterial vaginosis, is to use an antimicrobial agent, like an antifungal or an antibacterial agent, an antibiotic. Antibiotics can be given for bacterial vaginosis, including metronidazole, 
as an oral treatment or a gel or clindamycin, which can be used as a cream or an oral treatment as well. And they each have different potential side effects. Oral clindamycin can has, has the potential to cause some really serious problems with the gut. Fortunately, these are not common, but you can get megacolon, you can get C. diff, C. difficile, clostridia type of infection, which is a serious form of diarrhea infection. And metronidazole has a whole host of symptoms that you can get from nausea and diarrhea, and it can make people feel sick and feel headachy. So there's a whole host of side effects with the oral use of these medications. Vaginal use is pretty popular, uh, and they're pretty effective, um, about 80%. However, unfortunately, in a relatively short period of time, about half of women have recurrences. So there's a very good initial response, but half of women get recurrences. So clearly this isn't always the right solution, not in the long haul. So some of the recommended suggestions for how to treat recurrences, which are so common, is to keep treating, to give recurrent doses of antifungals or the antibiotics to just keep giving them every month, sometimes for six months in a row with altered regimens. So you wouldn't use the same initial regimen, but often using it several times a month or even sometimes several times a week for months on end. So one of the things that I've incorporated into my practice, in addition to trying to educate on how to prevent altered microbiomes and how to try to maintain the proper acidic environment, is by giving some vaginal, I call them vaginal health gels that include, but not as heavy duty as the contraceptive gel um, or some of the other additives that are part of that, but to give a specially formulated gel from a compounding pharmacy that includes lactic acid, a tiny bit of hydrocortisone, and some probiotics as well. Um, and so this can be quite helpful. So I usually have to add the probiotics myself. These can be done by putting little pinpricks in a little capsule of probiotics. And now many companies are making probiotics with different strains of lactobacillus that help to promote the health restoration of the vaginal microbiome by placing the lactobacilli into the vagina or taken orally to hope that this will help to grow the natural inhabitants and maybe even colonize. So this is a real beginning type of research area, how to use probiotics to help the vagina and prebiotics. So in addition to the lactic acid, I often use lactulose. So lactulose is known as a prebiotic. It's like a fiber, like I mentioned glycogen, is food that is produced by the vaginal mucosal cells that's encouraged by the presence of estrogen. And I can't always make, I can't control what the mucosal cells will do um, in every single woman, but while I'm trying to get the estrogen back in track and get everything balanced, all the hormones balanced, I will give some lactulose in the vaginal gel to help provide a food source to grow and nurture the lactobacilli that I will often give additionally with a probiotic. Now in my menopausal women, I always encourage some vaginal hormones. I use either estriol, which is found in pregnant women and can be obtained through a compounded pharmacy, or estradiol, that's the dominant estrogen that's made by the ovaries, or vaginal DHEAS, the hydroepiandrosterone sulfate, which also helps restore the vaginal health and vaginal microbiome. With DHEAS, it turns out that it's converted within the vaginal mucosal cells into estrogen, and then the estrogen that's produced in the vaginal cells can then enable them to produce the glycogen to promote, promote the growth of the lactobacilli. So women in the menopausal years always benefit 
by having some vaginal hormones on board. And even women with breast cancer now are usually permitted by their oncologists to use some vaginal hormones because the amount that gets circulated is so tiny. Now, there's also been more use of vaginal lasers and radiofrequency, and this may turn out to be useful for some women, but it's still also at the very early stages. It's not actually FDA approved for that use, but maybe that will be something helpful for many women in the future. We'll, we'll see. So in general, it's so important to be proactive to maintain the health of the vagina. It's always easier and better to maintain than to try to repair. The vaginal microbiome is incredibly complex and it hosts many different types of bacteria with the dominant, most favorable types being within the family of the lactobacilli. But even within that family, there are different strains, some being favorable, some unfavorable. We're just learning. This is a whole new world that has just begun to be explored. But it is so important. Women who do not have a healthy vaginal microbiome are at greater risk to have pregnancy complications, premature labor, infertility problems. They're more likely to have infections that are very serious if they have surgical procedures like hysterectomies. So it's so important for a host of reasons to have a healthy vaginal microbiome. Even now we think there may be leaky vaginas that can increase the risk of autoimmune disease when you don't have a really healthy vaginal mucosal lining and you don't have the right microbiome. So nurture and take care of the vaginal microbiome. It's a very important part of every female's health. So take care. I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Have a wonderful evening. Bye.